Hello, everyone. We're going to go over a very quick overview of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. I know some of you have heard an overview before, but for those who haven't, I want to just do that first. And then we're going to go through some resources that we have at Postpartum Support International and ways that we offer those resources to women and their families who are suffering from a perinatal mood disorder. So I am Bertie Meyer and I am a nurse with a master's in counseling and I'm also certified in perinatal mental health. I am the certification and training director for Postpartum Support International and I do training internationally. Haven't traveled in a couple of years like all of us because of COVID, but now traveling again. I'm a past president also. That's my email. If anyone would like to have that and send me questions later or comments. I worked in a hospital setting in Indianapolis, Indiana in the United States, a very large hospital system. I was based in the capital city of Indianapolis, but had 15 hospitals statewide. And I actually developed and ran a perinatal mood disorder program starting in 1997 and ran that for over 25 years. I did retire from that hospital three years ago and continue to work with Postpartum Support International. I really can't stop doing this work. It's so important. So like I said, I'm a nurse, master's in counseling, also a lactation counselor. I taught childbirth ed. I am also trained in perinatal bereavement for those who have lost babies either during pregnancy or afterwards, or for any reason that there was a loss. And pretty much I think I told you everything else. So that's me. It is the vision of PSI that every woman and family worldwide would have access to information, social support, and informed professional care to deal with mental health issues related to childbearing. PSI promotes this vision through advocacy and collaboration and by educating and training the professional community and the public. So the costs of untreated perinatal mood disorders it leads to increased costs of medical care, inappropriate medical care, child abuse and neglect, discontinuation of breastfeeding, family dysfunction, and it adversely affects early brain development. So it's very important to treat when someone has a perinatal mood disorder. Let's look at some more reasons to treat. There are poor fetal outcomes, even without taking medication, someone who's depressed or anxious during pregnancy, it increases the chances for inner uterine growth retardation, low birth weight, preterm birth, preeclampsia, adverse effects on neural development outcomes, stillbirth, and increased risk for congenital malformations. What's the prevalence? 80% of new mothers experience normal baby blues in the first two weeks after delivery due to hormone changes. 80% in whatever culture we have studied. So pretty common, pretty universal. One in five to seven women experience serious depression or anxiety during pregnancy or postpartum. One to two of a thousand will get psychosis. So more rare, but it does happen. So we don't just say it never happens. It does happen. One to two and a thousand is still one to two and a thousand. One in 10 fathers or one in 10 men. What are the myths that we seem to have around? And I'm just calling it postpartum depression because that's a word that most people use. So I'm using that, that when we use that term postpartum depression, it means it's only in the postpartum period and it's only depression. It means I don't love my baby or I want to harm my baby. It's all about crying. These are things that people think if you say postpartum depression, they're just crying all the time, that it's going to go away on its own. I'll just wait. 
that anxiety and depression don't happen during pregnancy when in fact they do it can start in pregnancy so these are some of the myths that we have of oh i don't have that and so because we don't quite understand what it really is and it's not just about crying and we'll look at that and it's not just about sadness we also have all over universally a problem with treating it's okay to treat my physical ailments like it's okay to treat my blood pressure or my diabetes but when it comes to talking about my emotional illness depression anxiety oh no 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 i don't mm -mm, i'm fine i'll work through that but you wouldn't argue about taking medication or treating your blood pressure or your diabetes we just have a lot of stigma around this here that is attached to this body, right? Lots of stigma. We have myths about motherhood. We have myths about getting pregnant. It's gonna be really easy or really hard. 50% of pregnancies are unplanned. We have myths about becoming a mother, about becoming a parent, about becoming parents together. Myths about being pregnant, about labor and delivery about breastfeeding, that it's gonna go really easy for everyone. We have myths that the baby's gonna sleep all the time. And some of the new moms still think they're gonna be superwoman, wife and mother, and that they're gonna keep it together like they did before. I'm showing pictures, of course, from that I use in my US uh, slideshow, but these are pictures that I show. What are the myths of pregnancy? That everyone has skinny legs and a cute little baby bump out front. And not everyone looks like that. And everybody's happy. So here's just more, just posed pictures of pure happiness all the time. And so we don't have pictures of, it's not always like that. And even on social media, we portray this picture that our life is perfect and everything's great. In our lives, we have seasons of giving and seasons of receiving. As a new parent, you're in the season of receiving. I always say to new moms, you've given before, you'll give again, but for right now, you're supposed to accept help and let other people help you. But that's hard for us sometimes, difficult for us to let others help us. Some, for some people that feels like weakness. So when you're pregnant for the first time, it's all about me. When I'm pregnant the first time, it's all about me. And I'm unaware about how much my life is about to change. There are huge hormone changes. When I'm pregnant, estrogen and progesterone are as high as they're gonna be. And when I deliver those crash down, and then up come oxytocin and prolactin and brings in my milk and my love hormone, my mothering hormone. I'm going to prenatal classes and I'm preparing for parenthood. So the pregnant woman and her spouse are going to classes, they're decorating the nursery and they're preparing for this baby, unaware of how much their lives are about to change. Pregnancy is not always a happy glowing time for everyone either. And then this moment happens. And I do use pictures of my own friends and family, by the way. So this moment happens, here's the baby. Now the focus is on the baby and forming an attachment. Not everyone falls madly in love with their baby right away, but we don't say that. And that's embarrassing to say for the people who don't fall madly in love. They're fatigued, they're sleep deprived. Overnight, she just lost all of her freedom, all control of her schedule, and she doesn't know what she's doing. They neither one know what they're doing. So loss of freedom, you don't get a come and go as you please anymore. No control of your schedule, it's now the baby's schedule. You took classes, prenatal classes, you read books, but it really doesn't prepare you for what we call the fourth trimester when the baby's here and you realize, I really don't know what to do. 
And that really feels like your self-esteem kind of plummets because I don't know what I'm doing. Birth may not have gone as expected. You're learning new skills. This is a huge role transition, redefining yourself. You're now a mom, a dad, parents together. You had dreams and expectations and that may not fall into that. You're facing fears and feelings and renegotiating responsibilities and relationships. Who's doing the extra laundry? Who's going to the store to get food? Who is cooking? Who's doing laundry? Who's helping with all these things? We have to rely on support systems, our parents, our friends, our family. You're insecure about parenting. You don't know what you're doing. No one knows what they're doing. Establishing feeding the baby and physically and emotionally possibly healing from labor and delivery. So we don't think about the fact that there's lots of loss around the delivery of a baby, <clears throat> but there is. I already mentioned freedom and control and self-esteem because you don't know what you're doing. Also body image, finances, possibly image of your career, career potential. So our definition, perinatal, anytime in pregnancy, anytime in the first year postpartum, mood and anxiety disorders, they can begin, like it says, anytime in that first year. Common triggers for later onset, maybe someone started on birth control, had their first period or menses, um, they started on, um, they stopped breastfeeding, and or maybe even quickly stop breastfeeding, which would crash the more hormones, uh, increased family stress, going back to work outside the home, some kind of illness or hospitalization or loss and grief. So we're going to look quickly at types of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. We're going to look at depression, anxiety, panic, OCD, PTSD, bipolar mood disorder, and psychosis. These disorders can affect us at any time in our lives, but they tend to ramp up and they feel different and look different when you're pregnant or postpartum. So for instance, if you already had anxiety, now that anxiety does get worse and it looks different and feels different because it now, the anxiety revolves around taking care of a baby, having a baby, worrying about the baby and the anxiety of what if I'm doing it wrong? So the postpartum blues, it is not a mild form of depression. The overall mood is happiness. I said it peaks at three to five days due to hormone changes. So huge hormone changes. It affects 50 to 80% of women in diverse cultures. Symptoms include crying, feeling overwhelmed, and it does not last more than a couple of days to two weeks. If it's beyond two weeks, something else is wrong. Depression, sadness, crying, unexplained physical complaints like headache, backache, stomach ache, GI disturbances, possibly suicidal thoughts. Typically with depression, overeating and not really great food, like I would say junk food and sugar and chocolate. Sleep disturbances, typically with depression, oversleeping and still tired. Poor concentration, just can't think. Irritability and anger are very common. In fact, even sometimes rage. I say yelling at your toddler, yelling at your spouse, um, just very angry, hopeless and helpless. I'm never going to be myself again. And that's where suicide thoughts come from. I'll never be myself again. They'd all be better off without me. I'm no good to anyone. And guilt and shame. I've had people say, Bertie, I shouldn't be in your office. I have a wonderful home, a healthy baby, and a wonderful spouse. And yet I'm depressed. I'm anxious. Why? I shouldn't be here. I'm overwhelmed. Really common thing I hear. I'm overwhelmed. If I'd known it was going to be this hard, I wouldn't have had a baby. I think I've made a huge mistake. Again, not everyone falls madly in love with their baby. Maybe they can't take care of themselves or their family. They haven't bathed. They're not brushing their teeth. And suddenly no joy or pleasure in the activities they used to enjoy. 
Anxiety could be going along with their depression. They have mood sing swings. This just doesn't feel like me. They may not say, I think I have postpartum depression. They just say, this doesn't feel like me. Something's not right. I haven't been myself since the baby's been born. And that gives them a sense of worthlessness. Depression and anxiety go together a lot. You'll see them together with sometimes anxiety being the presenting factor, the most common thing that they feel, anxiety, but maybe with underlying depression or depression is what is the most obvious thing that they're feeling with some underlying anxiety. But we looked at depression, let's look at anxiety and panic. Anxiety, agitated, can't sit still, excessive concern about baby's health or their own health, on high alert, Appetite changes, typically with anxiety, they can't eat, no appetite, they're losing weight rapidly. They can't fall asleep, they can't stay asleep, they can't go back to sleep. Constantly worrying, racing thoughts, shortness of breath, heart palpitations, and then they might go into a full-blown panic attack. Really strong heart palpitations, get short of breath, maybe their lips go numb, their... Um, face goes numb, their hands go numb, they actually feel chest pain, they end up in the emergency department, emergency room, thinking they're having a heart attack, and really they just get told it is postpartum de uh, depression and panic. And once you've had a panic attack, you panic about having another panic attack. And the three greatest fears, and you'll hear it described just like this, I thought I was dying, I thought I was losing control and I thought I was going crazy. Let's look at OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Classic symptoms, cleaning, checking and rechecking, maybe counting things in a certain, um, have a certain number of things, a sense of order. So if you already had um, OCD, with cleaning and things being neat and in order. Now with a brand new baby, this is really ramped up. Um, these, and this could be either parent. Um, these people don't want you touching their baby. And most people don't want you touching their baby, especially if you don't even know them or kissing their baby, just don't do it. But now they're really very protective. And during COVID, it was really, even more anxiety about germs and about baby catching COVID and parents getting COVID, but cleaning and now over cleaning and keeping baby over clean and changing diapers frequently, checking and rechecking is baby breathing, is the house locked? And a sense of order, like I'd like to help you with the laundry, but I don't fold the towels the way that you fold the towels and so you can't let me do it. Where things have to be in a certain order and this really gets in the way. The other way that obsessive compulsive disorder looks, and it's the most misunderstood, is this. I clearly saw my daughter gray and dead under the water. I couldn't give her baths or take her swimming or put her anywhere near a body of water. What kind of mother thinks these things? My daughter would have been better off without me. Intrusive thoughts are intrusive, repetitive thoughts, usually of harm coming to baby. There is tremendous guilt and shame. They are horrified by these thoughts. And now they become hypervigilant, making sure these things don't happen. And moms and even dads engage in behaviors to avoid harm or minimize triggers. We have to educate the parents that thought does not equal action. So they come out of the place in your brain where you wanna protect your baby. It's taken and twisted and said, what's the worst that can happen? They might see images in their head of something harm coming to baby. They might actually see themselves harming the baby. Um, images, pictures, a movie playing in their head, a story they tell. So this is just a really quick picture of what if, what if I drown her? What if I drop her? What if I accidentally hurt her? What if I fall down the stairs? So common triggers would be heights, sharp objects, knives and scissors. Um, traffic is a common trigger, being afraid in traffic. Baby's now in the back seat, worried about having a wreck with baby, baby getting harmed. 
So heights, sharp objects, water, traffic, and some people even possibly having sexual thoughts. Perinatal OCD is one of the many perinatal mood and anxiety disorder that's not talked about. And it's um, perinatal women are two times greater risk for it. And 65% of those people have depression going along with their OCD intrusive thoughts because they're so horrified and feel awful about it. And what if I really do it, which they're not going to. So we have evidence-based treatments, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy helps and exposure therapy, but you must be highly trained in these. Also medications, um, the SSRIs, as we call them, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, really help with medication management and intrusive thoughts. 88% of new parents get intrusive thoughts after having a baby, but that doesn't necessarily mean 88% of new parents have OCD. It kind of slowly goes away for most parents, but some people really have a diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder and it doesn't go away. It's very, very disturbing and gets in the way of living. So. Now let's look at PTSD or perinatal post-traumatic stress disorder. When Ariana was born, I tore badly. And in the days that followed, I've developed an infection. I started having terrible dreams, dreams about being chased and raped by men with knives. I was exhausted, but I began to fear falling asleep. The dream images then came during the day, triggering grief and sobbing. Imagine these are potentially traumatic events that someone would have an emergency cesarean, they would have a postpartum hemorrhage, prematurity, stillbirth, unexpected neonatal intensive care admission, uh, severe preeclampsia, hyperemesis gravidarum, that's where they um, vomit 24 seven during pregnancy, traumatic vaginal birth, and on and on, okay? Finding out baby has something wrong with it, either in pregnancy or suddenly at delivery. And um, there were four themes that one of our researchers found, those who had traumatic births, they felt like you abandoned them and you did things to them without asking and you didn't support them. You didn't talk to them. You didn't tell them what was, what was happening. You betrayed their trust. And fourth theme was, did you have to do all that to me? Remember that trauma is in the eye of the beholder. One in three women experience some kind of birth trauma, and trauma is based on their perception, not on the physician's perception. There also could be trauma in the partner who witnessed a traumatic birth. In the United States, one in three women have been sexually abused. And so when people come in with, women come in with a previous history of either physical abuse or sexual abuse, then their body remembers those things at delivery, and that can also cause even more trauma at a delivery. There could be trauma also or post-traumatic stress disorder in those whose babies go to NICU. Of course, those who had a stillbirth end up staying in neonatal intensive care. So we always remember that too. Here's some websites that are helpful for um, new parents to use. Okay, let's look at psychosis or one to two in a thousand women will develop psychosis onsets usually in the first couple of days to the first couple of weeks, but it can happen later. They have delusions such as their baby's eyes are glowing, they're possessed by a demon, they're having hallucinations, they hear things, voices that aren't there, they see things that aren't there. It can wax and wane, which means one minute they can be okay and 10 minutes from now they're not okay. And so many times it's hard to recognize. Many people are not trained in it to recognize it. And then a psychotic break occurs. And that is when um, it's really a medical emergency and horrible outcomes. It is treatable. Type one or type two bipolar disorder is thought to be 86% of people with psychosis what, what is happening, but the other 14%, we just don't always know. But risk factors also are a history of psychotic episodes or a family history of psychosis or bipolar. 
20 out of 30 postpartum women with bipolar disorder experienced a psychotic episode and not staying on medication, they will relapse. So I'm not going to go into a lot about bipolar. Just know that it's that we really should be watched. They should be watched closely during pregnancy and postpartum. So who gets a perinatal mood disorder? It's not all about hormones. It's about risk factors. Biggest risk factor is if someone in your family had a perinatal mood disorder, it runs in families. Your mom might have had it. Your sister had it. Any family or personal history of all the things we just talked about, plus eating disorder, suicide that runs in the family, any of those things. History of sexual abuse, um, physical abuse. You were a moody teenager, really bad premenstrual syndrome, irritability, mood changes, hormonal birth control made you moody and irritable. So just hormone changes. Abruptly discontinuing breastfeeding crashes down hormones and can cause changes in anxiety and depression. Diabetes, thyroid imbalance, fertility challenges, infertility, taking fertility medications, inadequate support from either partner or family, interpersonal violence, any other relationship stress, financial stressors, childcare stressors, recent loss or a move, barriers to care, institutional racism, seasonal affective disorders, lack of sleep, which is really common with new parents, physical pain, unresolved grief or loss with previous losses, neonatal death, uh, elective abortion, selective reduction or um, intrauterine loss, complications with relationship with your own mother, when you have a baby, suddenly your mother, your relationship with your mother does come back to you wondering, maybe your mother's in another country. Maybe your mother died. Maybe you don't speak to each other. Maybe you have a very volatile relationship. Maybe you were abandoned, neglected, or abused by mother. Complications during pregnancy, birth, or breastfeeding, health challenges for parents or baby, temperament of baby, age-related stressors, really young teen or maybe older woman in your 40s. Perfectionism gets in the way. Everything has to be perfect, and it's not always perfect after having a baby. Returning to work outside the home. And again, like I said earlier, this study just showed that they may not say, I think I have postpartum depression or even recognize it. They might say, I feel really overwhelmed. I feel like my emotions are on a roller coaster. I feel irritable. I feel alone. I feel isolated. Something's not right. So we have a great handout on our website, postpartum.net, and it just reviews an overview of all those things I just talked about, all the ways that a perinatal mood disorder can look, the symptoms, signs and symptoms, some treatment options, and some risk factors. Not all of them, but it's a great um, handout if you want to use it for education. Our motto is you're not alone. This affects one in five to seven women, one in 10 men. You're not to blame. You didn't do something wrong. You happen to have a lot of risk factors. It's not reflection of a weakness or something you did. And all symptoms are treatable. It's a sign of strength to reach out. You will get better. How do we get better? Medical evaluation, possibly going on medications. Uh, mental health or getting uh, psychotherapeutic help with a counselor, a psychologist, Social support is really one of the greatest help to new moms going through this and learning parent-child support and intervention, learning new things about baby, how to raise a baby. We don't know those things. So we need all those things together to get well. We have resources through PSI for families. And I just wanna show you so we can give some ideas for what you can do in Thailand. At postpartum.net, come to our website and look. We have resources for family. We have a hotline. We also have what we call a warm line or a helpline. With a hotline, someone answers when they call. With a helpline, they leave a message in both in English or Spanish, and someone gets back to them within a, uh, like two to three hours and helps find them resources. We also on the hotline 
connect them, help them find resources. We have local support volunteers in every one of our states in the United States and in over 40 countries. And those volunteers keep track of where the resources are in their communities. I did this for the state of Indiana until this year. Other people now have taken that over. We just want when someone calls to ask for help to help them find the help. Where are support groups? Where are the providers that are going to help with counseling or therapy? Where are the people that prescribe medication that have been trained in this field? Here are some of our international coordinators. And yes, you'll notice that Thailand is not on there, which we're gonna soon remedy, right? We have online support groups that anyone around the world is welcome to attend. They are welcome to attend. When I facilitate the groups, I have people from all over the world. Sometimes they're there at the oddest times for them, but it's important to them to come. So please, um, advertise these and we're gonna work on you also having your own support groups and um, using this model. We have different types of group. We have for NICU parents, we have it for pregnancy after loss, we have it for grief and loss for those who have lost uh, military moms, we have it for queer and trans, we have it just for OCD, we have um, perinatal mood disorders for pregnant or postpartum and on and on, fertility challenges. So um, we recently added one for early loss. So what about social support? What is it about social support that's really helpful? Women will say to me, yes, I, it helped me in therapy. Yes, the medication helped, but I couldn't have made it without my support group. In support group, they finally have that sense of I am one in five to seven, and I'm not alone. I am not the only one that feels this way. And it is a place where whatever you have, whatever kind of social support groups we have, oh, we also have peer mentor programs, but in the groups, and that's where someone who's further along down the road helps those that just now are starting their journey of um, growing and um, getting better. It helps in the groups just to say what you want to say, and they're learning from other moms in the group. It can be in person, if we're safe to be in person again in places, it also is virtual. So do you have it as open versus closed? Um, do you have babies come? Are families welcome? For my group that I did for years and for our groups online, some we have for couples, but most we have just for the mom, either pregnant or postpartum. Um, there are many educational components to it. The facilitator has to be ready to do some education. <clears throat> Babies are welcome is what I say, because I wanna see the mom interact with the baby. Do you call it a certain thing? different names for it. What happens at group? We have guidelines. This is a safe place. There's no mommy camps. What's that mean? That means that you're not a better mom if you breastfeed or you're a stay-at-home mom or you make your own baby food. Um, we check in. We start out introducing ourselves. Give us your name and your baby's name and hold your baby is. So we go around with introductions. Then I go over the guidelines. This is a safe place. Please don't offer advice unless asked. Don't try to give other people unwanted advice. They have enough of that already. Please don't say your intrusive thoughts out loud. If you had a traumatic birth, just say I had a traumatic birth. Please don't give details. We do, you do those things with your therapist, but not at group. Our goals are to be honest, to be safe, to be non-judgmental. So we just go over a few of those and then we check in. We've introduced ourselves and then we check in. And the facilitator like me would keep this going and make sure that each, each person gets a chance to share. And we've already said it's safe, it's confidential, and this is a safe space. And when, after introductions, then I say, how was your week? How are you eating? So we talk about self-care. How are you sleeping? Are you walking? Are you taking time just for you? What are you doing just for you? And as you have each person check in with this information one at a time, 
and kind of share in group. If someone says, I feel irritable and moody and rageful, does anyone else? And then we say, how many other people? And they might raise their hands or they might say, yes, me too. But you still want to give each person a chance to share and that they can say, I'm not madly in love with my baby and not feel shame in this group and not feel so alone. Popular topics that came up for me as I run group, they want to talk about sex. Um, sex is different. It changed the vaginal wall. There's dryness. Or also, I'm too tired to have sex is what we hear a lot. Talk about your mother's in law or your mother's giving unwanted advice. Um, sleep. How do I get sleep with a new baby? And unwanted advice from anyone. Um, interpersonal now kind of problems with your spouse that you never had before. This is a whole new life. And we kind of go over mindfulness-based stress reduction, teach some breathing techniques, and talk about, please let people help you. So we also have a referral and consultation resources. We have a directory where we list all the people that have been trained and they sign up after they've taken our training. They can't be on there unless they have taken some training in this. So our um, people can find, if you're trying to find a therapist or someone to prescribe medicines or a support group, they're on our directory. These are places to look for resources for medication in pregnancy and breastfeeding. We have a psychiatric consult line. Of course, it is only for the US, but there's an idea for something to have. Medical prescribers, so your um, obstetric providers, family practice providers can call here and say, I know I don't know as much about medications. They talk to a reproductive psychiatrist who helps them decide the best course of action for the particular patient they're calling about. We have virtual rounds once a week through uh, Mass General Hospital. It's something that's at two o'clock Eastern time if you ever have a chance to tune in. Um, our specialized support coordinators, not necessarily groups, but just someone to talk to with many different areas as you can look at here. We have PSI chapters in most of our states and we're working on the ones that don't have them. We also have a closed Facebook group that anyone anywhere around the world can join. And there are people on there. We have 10 moderators, 14,000 members, and this is moms talking to each other about how they feel and it's closed and it's safe and it's watched closely by our monitors. And usually somebody's on there all the time. We also have a phone call that they can just call and talk to someone every Wednesday for moms, once a month for dads. We have Smart Patients Forum. Anyone can use this and it is moderated by PSI. We have Perinatal Mental Health Alliance for People of Color and we have a bookstore. We have Professional Development, a two-day training um, that is open to anyone. I know time is a difference. We try to have it in three different time zones in the US. Um, we have people come from all over the world to our virtual trainings that we also have them in person. And then we have webinars that you can sign up for and then watch that in your own time because it's recorded. We have advanced psychotherapy, advanced psychopharmacology, frontline training and president's advisory council series. So the frontline provider training is just for those who want to learn a little bit. I just want to overview and then how do I prescribe medication? There's also quarterly a maternal mental health 101 that I give. It's 90 minute free webinar and registration is required it, and it, the recording is shared the next day. So if you can't attend in real time, you will get a recording. You can watch it at a time that's good for you. So I'll be doing that recording again and you sign up for it at this link. I'm doing that again on December 15th. Um, we have a certification in perinatal mental health and we can talk more about that later. We have videos that you can use. We have brochures. We have, um, this is a 15 minute DVD in both English and Spanish. We have awareness posters in English and Spanish. And as my final, slide um, just to remember that we train professionals and we help those who are seeking our help and connect them with those who have been trained so that they know they're not alone, they're not to blame, and that they will be well. 
and now we can talk soon. And I want to stop the recording. So um, it was good to talk with all of you, and I hope it was helpful.